On Education is sponsored by Participate, a community learning platform where the world learns together. Later in the episode, we'll hear about one of Participate's communities, Teach the Global Goals, and how you can get involved in its free community learning opportunities with educators around the world. I love New York. It's really cool. It, it's, uh, it's, it's, is, it's, is that how you feel? It, well, no, it's cool. <laughs> But it's definitely it's definitely dirtier and it's definitely smellier um, than than almost anywhere I've ever been. Welcome to On Education, part of the On Podcast Media Network. My name is Mike Washburn, and I'm Brad Schreffler. Friends, we have an awesome pod for you today. We catch up after a few weeks off, make some book recommendations, talk about limiting your work hours, and our guest for today is the author of the Maker Playbook, Caroline Habig. We're going to talk about limiting our work hours after working a full day and, and then, then doing a podcast podcasting. at 8 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. So the, the moral of the story is do as we say, not, not as, as we, we do, do yeah. I guess, exactly. I guess. <laughs> <clears throat> Though... Um, you know, I'm still finding time. Hopefully, you are too, um, to play some video games, and we should definitely talk about that. Because I like how we've been off for like three weeks, and the first thing you want to talk about is video games. Like you've no, been jonesing. Like yeah, 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 yeah. This is the real point of this show. Yes, it's just to talk about what I've been playing. And, and you know what's funny is that um, just before we went live, I got a message on Slack because um, my company Paper we have a Minecraft server. Um, and so we've been playing, I've been playing on the paper Minecraft server, um, uh, quite a bit building, uh, bringing my experience to the table. Um, <laughs> so there is now an iron golem farm and, uh, a villager trading hall and, um, and, and, uh, I, another fellow created a villager breeder, um, which, which has like, you know, all those moral and ethical quandaries, but you know, whatever. You are uh, such a nerd. <laughs> yeah, I love, I, I'll tell you, man, it's so funny. I was talking to someone in a meeting today and, and she was asking me about Minecraft for her kids. And I'm like, I'm 40, almost 42 years old. And I still play Minecraft like a couple days a week at least. It makes me sad because I'm at a high school now and I never see kids playing Minecraft on their laptops anymore. And it's like the only game they can play on their laptops. So I, yeah. I, you would think just by process of elimination, some would, but I never see it happen. And it kind of makes me sad. But I figure later yeah, on in life, yeah. they'll probably get back there because I didn't like it as a kid. You know, I didn't, I mean, it wasn't out when I was a kid technically, but I mean, I didn't like it till way later till it was, you know, gone. But that's the other part is I don't know what three quarters of the things you just said are, but I've played a lot of Minecraft. That's the thing that's kind of cool about it is like I've played, I just have never built an iron golem farm or anything. Like I've never done any of those things. I just yeah. have built, I've built houses. That's pretty much the, what I've there built. There is always something to learn. I, yeah. I, I'm, I've been playing Minecraft, you know, fairly consistently for like at least seven or eight years. Hmm. And th I am le constantly, constantly learning things. Um, and I love that I can be, I can, I am an expert, I am an expert at this game, Brad, and I am still, I am still constantly learning things. Um, I'm, I'm so. playing beat star right now. That's what I'm playing. That's what Tell I'm playing. Tell me about beat star. It is like, it's a mobile game and it is, um, as my wife said, watching me play it the other day, she goes, is this like dance dance revolution for your thumbs? I said, yes, that's exactly what oh. it is. And I love it. It's so much fun. You listen to music and you hit the buttons at the right time and it's great. And it makes me happy. And it's so easy. Well, I mean, it's not easy. That's not true, but it's just like relaxing and entertaining. And it's, it's a freemium model, which I can't stand. But other than that, it's so good. It's like I'm totally popular down songs. I'm it's totally like downloading it right now. It's good. It's a lot of fun. You're going to love it. It's great. So, and you unlock songs as you go. I haven't had to put any money into it, and I've kept playing for, you know, an hour or so a day and been fine. It's, it's an exciting. hour? Wow, you're Maybe. Like into it. Maybe. No, 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 no. You can't take it back. It's like passive. <laughs> passive hour. Like 20 minutes here, 15 minutes there kind of stuff. Sure. That's what I mean. Yeah, sure. Uh <laughs> I, I've been, I've been, I have this mobile, or this uh, idle game. Um, I was, I had to re, it's funny, I had to reset my, restart my computer um, before we did this, um, because my mic was not sounding properly. And it's because I hadn't restarted my computer in probably a week. Um, it's because I've been playing an idle game 
and I just leave it running overnight <laughs> called Melvor, M-E-L-V-O-R. You should look it up. It's on Steam. Um, you can play it on a browser and it's free, but you can pay for it on Steam um, and, you know, uh, help give the developers some money because it's actually really quite good. Um, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm training my fire making skills right now, right over there on, <laughs> uh, to the right of your lovely face. Oh. Um, so that's that. Uh, also excited about New World, an MMO coming out tomorrow um, that is a big deal. It's Amazon's first big game. I've been seeing a lot of hype like, around develop, it. Developed by Amazon, Amazon Game Studios, and uh, yeah, uh, New World. Uh, I'm going to play it with um, uh, with some friends, and uh, I'm pretty excited uh, to play it. So I'll be streaming it too, because I am actually a New World content creator. I'm, I'm in their content creator program. You fancy. Shockingly. You fancy. Um, well, you know, whatever that means. So... So that that I'll be streaming New World. Um, I'm also reading a lot. Um, I've been I've been on this kick for a while now. Reading I'm reading at least an hour just about every night. I've been doing that for well since the spring, almost cons- consistently, almost yeah. an hour every night, which has been awesome. Read a lot of um, you know work related like nonfiction books, but I've been reading Dune, and I've been tweeting Dune and tweeting <laughs> quotes from Dune. Yep. And Dune is my jam now. Like, <laughs> it is so damn good. I saw the trailer for the new movie yesterday. We went and saw um, Shang Chi, and like the trailer was on it again. I was like, man, it does look really good. Ugh. It looks really good. The funny thing about the movie, so I need the movie to be a hit because because it's not like the first movie. Like the first movie will be good. The second movie will be bonkers. Yeah. If you like read it, when you read the books, you'll see. And the and like the fifth, like where I if they go by like two movies a book, the fifth or sixth movie will also be just completely insane. So uh, I need the movies to be a hit. The only thing that concerns me a little is that this first movie has like tons of stars, mm-hmm. right? You know, and that you know, spoiler alert: some of them aren't going to be, you <laughs> in know, the sequel. <laughs> in all of the in all of the movies. Yeah. So, um, you know, they need to definitely like their casting needs to be super good to continue. Um, uh, uh, you know, casting like really big names for for some of these emerging roles that will come up later. Um, um, and I'm excited to see who they cast because. Um, there's some pretty big roles coming up, you know, and uh, this first movie, I need this first movie in my life so bad <laughs> to be really good because I need I need more Dune movies. Um, so I, I, hope I this, feel like I really as, as someone who's only recently gotten into Dune to say that you need this in your life so bad is is like is like a newborn saying how long like when I'm when my middle school kids are like, I've been waiting for this my whole life. I'm like, your whole life has been 10 years. Get out of here. Uh, you don't have any like it's the same thing. Whereas people like my dad who read these books 60 years ago are I like, I can't believe this is yeah. a 50 year old like series. The first book was written in 1964. It stuns me. Because of the level, the like the, the 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 cinematic nature of the writing, it's mm-hmm. why people have been trying for forty years to make movies and video games from it. Yep. Because you can read it and you see it. Mm-hmm. It's the first book I've ever read where I I see, I see it in my head what they're doing, um, because it's it's such fabulous, beautiful writing super well described like everything is super well described that's why the books are so long is because they're just Mm -hmm. there's just tons of words describing like different things and the the nature of the flowing of the garments and like that kind of (laughs) stuff right it's amazing um so good you've been reading i've been reading too yeah i actually i've been back into audiobooks again i've, I've cut back on the podcast i listen to and i'm getting back into audiobooks is a little brain break kind of um Love which it. is a ridiculous statement because they are not things that are stopping my brain but it's just a different kind of listening yeah um, but i just listened to hail mary which is andy weir's new book yeah um author of the martian and um, yeah. that book and a couple other ones but this one project hail mary was was really really good i i really enjoyed it um 
I know, bought it. Yeah, it's a while it's, ago. And the audiobook is really good too. Like it's audio is actually really central to the story. Um and so the way they do the audiobook is so so interesting and so well done and it's just, you know, it it he just it's he writes such good books because the science is all so interesting and explained in a way that is science, like definitely sciency and nerdy, but also understandable and approachable. Um, and it's just twists and turns and things you don't expect. And I mean, it, it's, it's really, really good. It's got some of that survival aspects that you would get from like the Martian, but definitely, um, a different book, but I, I really, really enjoyed it. Highly recommend, highly recommend. I should, I should listen to it cause I have it on audible. Yeah. It's worth listening to. It's real good. I'm going to read, I think foundation after this, uh, after Dune. So foundation is the Asmanov series that is very like Dune esque. Like, mm-hmm. like in the sense that it was written a little bit after Dune, but but not much after Dune. And uh, Asmanov, you know, who is obviously, you know, um, you know, if I said As- Isaac Asmanov and and Frank uh, Hebert, you know, you would know who Isaac Asmanov is, right? Who's the writer of Foundation? But you wouldn't necessarily know the name of the writer of Dune, um, in my mind, anyways, off the top of your head. Um, so, so it's Asmanov's big epic kind of series, uh, sci-fi-ish series. So, I, and there's a new show on Apple TV. Um, yeah, the new show. The, the new show's supposed to be good. I've I've seen some reviews of it, and they said it's they've said it's really really good. So it's worth uh, checking out. And it's got the guy like I love. I've watched Chernobyl probably three or four times, uh, and it's got one of the main the main character from Chernobyl. Nice. is in is in foundation so that's what makes me want to go and watch it for sure um so so that's you were, that's you were in new york recently games. you were I you was. were in new york recently how'd your trip go i love new york it's really cool it, it's uh it's, it's is is it's, that how you feel it, well no it's cool <laughs> but it's definitely it's definitely dirtier and it's definitely smellier um than than almost anywhere i've ever been and I, the, the other thing is the streets are super narrow. Like, I, I think it's super... So, so Toronto, for example, Toronto's a pretty old city. Like, not as old as New York, but close to as old as New York. And the thing about Toronto, when you're, when you're downtown Toronto, you'll notice that the streets are, are really wide. Super wide sidewalks, like triple wide sidewalks. A lot of big wide roads. It's because what they did was when they tore down, like, the old stuff and built the skyscrapers, they also redid, like, the grid. They redid the roads. And they didn't seem to do that in New York. They were just like, screw it. (laughs) Bash this shit down. New building. In the exact same footprint as the old stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so what you have is, like, super narrow roads. Like, it's still a grid. But all the roads and the sidewalks and like there's just tons of people and and it feels a lot more cramped than than a Toronto does. And Toronto's way cleaner than, than New York. <laughs> um, it's funny. I, I, I was telling some folks that I took a walk my first day there. I got there on a Wednesday. It was a travel day. Uh, I had one meeting. It was late in the afternoon. I got there around noon. So I had about three or four hours to kill. Uh, so I went to the Nintendo store. So of course. So my my walk from the Ninten- from the hotel to the Nintendo store is about an hour each way, and I thought I thought I should I should listen to something on uh, a podcast or something, and then I was like, no, I want to like I want to like listen to the people <laughs> to the city a little bit. It was, like that sounds weird to say, but you know what I'm saying. Like I wanted to yeah. like take it take it in um, from a sensory perspective, and it was everything. It was everything I wanted it to be. Um, there was like random people just walking down the street singing. There was people definitely yelling at each other. There was a lot of middle fingers, uh, tons of honking. Um, it was all of the things that I was kind of hoping it would be. Um, and it's it's um, New York is fascinating. It is like just it is America. To me in a <laughs> it is, it is America. <laughs> it's like it's just it's just everything that a Canadian thing. Like it's like the the mecca of capitalism. There's just people selling stuff yeah. everywhere. Like mm-hmm. there's there's stores, but then there's like patios, and then there's like 
just pop up like, tables of random everywhere, stuff everywhere uh-huh. all over the place pop up tables just people's just selling things just whatever they can sell and that's obviously that's there's some parts of that that are bad like in terms of like poverty and stuff like that but it's just and it's you hear people talking like if you overhear people talking um you wouldn't believe how many times you just walk by someone or walk past someone or around someone and you hear them talking about their next like idea or their business or their their the this is like one I, I all I, I remember this guy saying it's a business inside of a business man don't you get it <laughs> and i was like i was like i am dying to know what's a business inside what's the of a business, business inside the business i want to i want to know i want to know what your business <laughs> inside of a business is brother i'm trying to figure it out and you it caught me so, already i'm in <laughs> right you sold me tell sell me the business inside the business um so I, there was like stuff like that all over the place it's just it's non stop and it's uh like they said the city that never sleeps and and i it's just it's it's just non-stop it was really interesting i can't wait to go back it's uh it's it's and the food was amazing i went to some uh, just stunning restaurants um so yeah no it was awesome it, and and so much more safe than i thought it was going to be yeah i think it gets a pretty bad rap for safety but if i've never felt i've been there a couple of times i've never felt unsafe I, you know, was surprised at how many people were wearing masks just outside, even Mm -hmm. walking down the road um, way more than, frankly, even here. People were wearing masks just walking down the road. And it's because obviously people are in close quarters in those damn narrow sidewalks and and like just the population is 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 high, Um, you know, checking vaccine status at every restaurant I went into um you know checking checking your um yeah you get asking for your papers or whatever um it all felt really really safe um so yeah. it was neat yeah i'm excited to go back yeah i can't wait till you come down for fetc to see the exact opposite of that it's gonna be great it's gonna be awesome <laughs> i am i am really excited about fetc because of what paper is doing oh in between the time that we've talked and now um, Paper is a platinum sponsor of FETC, friends. Oh, yeah. um, just announced. Um, uh, so we are in, all in for FETC in like gigantic ways. Um, it is going to be awesome. So I'm excited about being in Florida um, yeah. a little. It's going to be great. Um, but, you know, um, uh, I'm hoping for maybe a third or fourth vaccine before i come down there just to keep myself extra safe it's probably a good de- it's probably a good decision maybe um, something like that i'll bring masks and get yelled at at restaurants or something you know it it, it would not be an episode of on education except for yeah, the last one where we only wanted to talk about fun things and nice yeah. things but other than that it wouldn't be an episode of on education if we didn't have some some twitter fodder you know if there wasn't some some twitter dumbass madness, tweet and uh and this this last couple of weeks we have been provided with one that you know it did not go over the way i think it was intended no um, so the the tweet was by brad johnson who is a superintendent principal i don't know what his technical title is he's a so now he's thinking he's just a, a motivational speaker but he was at one point a, a principal i think and um he he tweeted out uh uh, to the teachers who are really struggling, don't make long-term decisions based on short-term chaos. If you are overwhelmed, then you may feel like giving up, quitting, or even retiring. Get through this, back to a good place mentally and emotionally before making those decisions. Ooh, bad move, first off, first off, bad paper, move, paper is hiring. <laughs> <laughs> how's, that for a, how's that for a response? God, I'm I, hiring all the teachers. I so <laughs> I I actually believe, unlike some of these other times we've talked about tweets, I actually think this was well intentioned. I, yes. I do think it was well intentioned. I think it shows a lack of understanding that points out the problems people have with those that are no longer actually in education and just talk about education. Um and, also, and I, Short short term chaos. It's, yeah, it's almost two years what at this point. What the hell are you talking? Well, and that's just COVID. Yeah. Like, has the education not system not been in like absolutely abject chaos 
for the better part of a decade. Like, yeah. like your your education system is falling apart around you in so many ways. That short term chaos when when someone has to quit their job, and 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 I'm talking about Becky for example, our friend Becky quits her job, her full time teaching job. And is getting paid more to be an independent consultant for participate than she was teaching. And she's doing mm -hmm. participate part time. And you're telling me that the only chaos that you can think of is COVID and you're going to call it all short term. You know, when COVID even has been around for two years, get out of here. Yeah. It, you know, it was, um, it, it was, it was not a, not not his best work oh. um and like for an account that basically just tweets platitudes once a day like that's, i was gonna say that one's not going on the auto tweeter that one's not yeah that one got deleted <laughs> actually that one's been deleted which is part of the reason i read the whole thing uh because it was saved in the on education group dm um, oh posterity but um here here's my thing <laughs> is not only the short-term chaos piece because yeah that one jumped out at me right away the other one is when the job is what is causing or at least heavily contributing to the mental instability that a lot of us are going through in the field right now, you can't tell me to wait for my mental health to be better to make a decision about the thing that's negatively impacting my mental health. Yeah. I don't, like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, it just doesn't... I, and I get his point. Like, you don't make a major decision in grief. You don't make a major decision in anger. Like, you, you give yourself some time. But we're going on a long time in education right now. I mean, if you're a first-year teacher who started a month ago, maybe don't decide to quit. That makes sense. Give yourself a little bit of time. But otherwise, we've all been doing this a long time. It's not short-term, and it is not about making a decision when we're in a better place mentally. It's about this is part of what's causing the bad mental place. Like, it yeah. just doesn't – it's so backwards and just – and, I mean, he got jumped all over for this tweet. I mean, it was – it got some heat pretty hard, and he did delete it. And so I, I guess that's the closest thing you're going to get to a recognition of, of fault – from like there are a... there are there are states where I am stunned that there are still teachers mm -hmm. to teach. Yep. Like and I, and I get that you know it's your job and it's you're passionate about it and you love students and you you feel a calling and and all of that stuff. But you know there should be no shock, no shock that people are leaving the profession. Paper is hiring, by the way. <laughs> uh, and there should be no shock that people are leaving, and there should be no shame when they choose to do it because are you kidding me mm -hmm. i've it's it's never been like it is now yep. and you know this the short term chaos you know there's no indication that what has given you the indication that it's going to get better yeah what, was... what track record what track record tells you that florida that their education system is going to all of a sudden start paying their teachers better, respecting the the health and safety of their students and teachers. What gives you that impression? The, what track record do we have to go on? None, zero. You don't have to say it. I, I, I can say it. I'm no, good. we're we're getting rid of our state exams now. We're going from a once a year state exam to a progress monitoring plan, which I'm sure a a politician's definition of progress monitoring is exactly the same as mine. So it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, bad bad tweet. That one goes in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, that was pretty bad. That was pretty bad. Um, one more thing I had in here, and this this popped up on my feed today, and I, I really enjoyed it because it's something I've been I've been thinking about and dealing with a lot with my new job. Um, and the article I, I found is it's called the three or four hours rule, and it's by Oliver Berkman, and he kind of talks about um, this concept that we that especially with anything that's mentally stringent, so anything that's hard mental work, especially creative work, um, he talks about that really historically. It, you can't do more than three to four hours a day of that kind of hard thinking, creative work. So, um, you know, he, he talks, he pulls some other resources and some other books that people have written and talks about how, you know, going all the way back to, you know, things like um, Charles Darwin didn't work more than three or four hours a day. Charles Dickens, Virginia Woolf, Ingram Bergman, like all these people were known to have only done 
you know, three to four hours of intense mental work a day. That doesn't mean that's the only hours they worked. Obviously they did other things, but yeah, what I, what I really appreciated about it is not the idea that I can just work three or four hours a day. Right. But the idea of sort of identifying those three or four hours as sort of sacred time in my day. Right. Mm-hmm. So knowing, okay, my best work time is right after lunch and it is, you know, from one to three or one to four. And that is blocked off time. I'm not going to answer emails in that time. I'm not going to do all those other things. I'll do all those the rest of the day. But that time is controlled, managed time to get my three hours of super productive work done. And then the rest of my day can be organized chaos, controlled back and forth, addressing fires and putting stuff out. But that identified hard function time. Um, But the other thing he said, and this is the quote that got me to the article, actually, um, and it's and I just thought it was it was so, so, so good. Um, and now I can't find the quote in the result be- or in the article because I didn't plan. All right, there it is. The truly valuable skill here isn't the capacity to push yourself harder, but to stop and recuperate despite the discomfort of knowing that work remains unfinished, emails unanswered, other people's demands unfulfilled. Like, I think as a, that spoke to me so much as an educator because... The idea that this job could never end, right? As an administrator or a classroom teacher or anyone else, like you could do this job 24-7, 365, and there would still be work to do. You have to get comfortable with letting stuff going, gone undone. You know, I tell my people all the time in my building, the people that report to me, like, the work will be there tomorrow, guys. Go home, see your families, or just sit on the couch. Like, I don't care, but just go. It's already an hour after you were supposed to leave. Go. Get out of the building and go home. It'll be there tomorrow. It'll be there tomorrow. Um, and it's it's a difficult thing to get used to if you're the kind of person who wants to get the work done. But it is so critical to just be able to walk away at the end of the day. It's funny. It's a good reminder because I actually talk about it in my the keynote that, I, that I've done a couple of times. Um, if you, if you want to listen to that, you can go back probably 150 episodes <laughs> in the podcast. It's somewhere yeah, as a recording, um, from probably May or June, 2019. Um, and I talk about finding the best times, exactly what you're talking about, finding the best times to do your, the work that you need to do or the, that you're good at. So, um, it's funny though, cause I need to apply this to my life right now. So this is a good reminder because I'm writing this like really intense document and um, and I missed my window this morning to sit down and, and, and do some writing and I'm missing my window tonight to be honest because I know that my best times for doing this kind of writing are like between 7 and 9 in the morning and then between like 8 and 11 at night um, or 8 and 10 kind of thing at night and um uh, I've been trying to force myself to do some of this writing during the day uh, in between meetings, and it's not perfect. It's not coming out exactly the way I want, and I know why. It's because I'm trying to shoehorn writing into times when I know I'm not good at it, because um, I am a pretty good writer, and I know what I want to say, but you know, jamming writing time into a time when I'm not in, in the mode to do it isn't working for me. Um, and it happened today, man. It was like, I have like a serious case of writer's block today. I tr- I stared at the screen for easily an hour and a half trying to figure out what to say and I couldn't get it done. And I just wasted my time because yep. I was trying to force myself to do it. So, um, you know, you, you gotta stop, you know, this actually goes back to Brad's tweet too. It's like, you know, the way you do, If you do want to work through this season of COVID and teaching, you've got to be more aggressive at maintaining your boundaries with your work and your life and and doing the things that are smart for you, um, you know, so that you maintain a healthy lifestyle. That means if you, you know, don't don't stay up until 11 o'clock doing, you know, something grading papers, right? That's mm-hmm. that's not healthy for you. Um, the papers will get graded. Um, do it. Do it again tomorrow. Do it. Do it later. Um, but go to bed. Get a good night's sleep because that's what's killing you. Hug your kids. Like just hug your wife. Hug your husband. Hug whoever. Like just 
be with people, watch a TV show. I mean, that's, play I think that's game. part of it. Exactly. Play like, Minecraft with your kids. Like, as much as people may not Try care about that. the video games or whatever that we talk about all the time, like, that is what it is for us, right? Like, that is that time where it's, I'm willing to give time to that because it means I can be more productive later. And I think that's the piece of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, hmm. exactly. Hmm. All right. Well, that is a great place to end this segment. So, when we come back, we are going to talk to Caroline Habig about maker learning. It's a great conversation, so stay with us. It is like a spider web. These diverse interconnected spaces help and inspire us to understand, empathize, and take local action in our schools. That's Yahaira Guedes, a facilitator within the Teach the Global Goals community on Participate. The community is home to hundreds of resources, courses, and educators around the world, collaborating on how to bring the United Nations' 17 Sustainable Development Goals into the classroom. With our students, and as a collective, to be a powerful force to achieve the vision of a more peaceful, healthy, and equitable world. We'll hear more later in the episode from another community facilitator on why you should get involved. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Our guest is a professional learning consultant for teachers, instructional coaches, and administrators, helping districts prepare for one-to-one and to develop inclusive maker learning practices. She's an Apple Distinguished Educator, a Google Certified Innovator, and a recipient of the ISTE Outstanding Young Educator Award. She's also the author of The Maker Playbook, a guide to creating inclusive learning experiences, which is out now from ISTE. Welcome to the podcast, Caroline Habig. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for joining us, Caroline. I I have your book here, and I've been flipping through it the last few days. Um, I, I just got it in the mail because the U.S. Postal Service is awesome. Um, that I'm a Canadian, sorry, so uh, I can make... To, I was going to say, make... to be clear, mine got to me in no time. So yeah. it sounds a lot like it was that last mile problem, and it was Canada that screwed up. Because okay. U.S. got me mine just Listen, fine. Brad, whatever helps you sleep at night. Um, I, I've been reading this for the last few days because that's when I got it. And I love, to be honest, um, because I've harped on this a little bit on Twitter, that I don't see a lot of technology, like talk in this book uh other than what might be you know necessary to facilitate the virtual learning which you do talk about and we're going to get to in a minute um but it reinforces that making isn't about the tools and it isn't about the technology and it isn't about the internet and and devices Uh, am i right about that and and what's your what's your kind of your 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 philosophy on on this because i i think it's intentional oh it's completely intentional um i believe that it is definitely about how do we look at all learners and how do we shape how they grow as critical thinkers innovative problem solvers and to me that really takes you know we need to take a really strong look at what are powerful instructional practices practices for learning and and go from there i think a lot of times people like to start with tools and then walk it backwards but i've always been a firm believer that we really need to look at what are those research-based strong instructional strategies And looking at the science of learning and how um, people's brains work and then go from there and then find our, you know, how do we build those experiences out? So I'm glad you noticed that because that um, definitely was one of the biggest uh, motivations when I, I first was doing this work and was like, you know, I feel like this maybe could be a book because I don't see a lot out there that does that. Um, and, and yeah, that's definitely something I'm most passionate about as well. So, um, yeah, like I don't see the word iPad. I I mean, I haven't looked, I I mean, I didn't scour every single word again. Um, but, but I mean, there's not a lot of technology in here and I I think that that's great, right? 
Yeah, there's a there's examples of yeah. how you bring it in and how it relates to different uh, standards and, and skill development, but it's not the focus. The learning is first, the tools come second. Yeah, I mean, I was looking through it. I mean, even the the like the the examples and the pictures and the 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 classroom examples. There are a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of papers in here that I think would kind of surprise people. Um, but I, you know, one of the things I want to know, and I notice right away, I mean, there, there's an entire chapter on UDL integration. There's, you know, and really the, the book comes down to this idea of sort of inclusive making versus just making. So can you kind of, what, what is the difference in your eyes between sort of making culture versus inclusive making? So something that's kind of interesting is that, and this is kind of funny where, yeah, we talked about how the focus is in technology, but I do talk a lot in the book about the importance of broadening our definition of how learners can engage in design thinking and specifically prototyping, because I also believe that a lot of the digital tools available to us increase opportunities for accessibility within maker learning. And I think it definitely is looking at, you know, I think there's a variety of modalities that are important to incorporate. And I think when we look at physical, digital uh, materials and technologies, we can reach more learners. And I think when it comes to creating an inclusive learning environment, whether it's a maker space, whether it's doing maker learning in your more traditional classroom, I think there's key things we can do that just set the stage. So an example of that would really be, um, I, having, having, um, kind of just easy to use grab and go resources for teachers or having teachers doing some of this front loading work that then makes the student experience more scaffolded. So for example, one of the resources mentioned in the book, and then we also have a lot of uh, digital component resources um, assets as well that, you know, not only do I talk about this is what it could look like, but if someone wanted to say download or modify anything, uh, those are available as well. But say having check for understanding cards ready to go that teachers can choose what's most appropriate for where learners are in their process with design, all the way to looking at self-regulation charts to get kids being able to have different ways to reflect on and share how are, is their work going at a certain phase in the design process. And then just sometimes it's the littlest things, uh, but they can really heighten how all learners are able to engage in that design thinking process. Can't help but wonder, I, I don't have this experience, so I'm super interested in maybe if you've seen this in action or uh, maybe even someone in our audience who wants to weigh in on Twitter after, but this idea of making for inclusivity for you know, um, high need students, students that have, you know, exceptionalities. Um, you know, I, I would love, I would love to hear how that's done in, in practice. Cause you know, there's, there's nuance to teaching as it is, you mm -hmm. know, with, with, um, t teaching high need students. Um, and then there's nuance to making that is, that is exceptional in and of itself. And, and putting those together, I imagine it would be complicated, but I also imagine it would be incredibly rewarding in practice, yeah? Yeah, I think a lot of times, though, we have to step back and look at, I mean, the great thing about universal design for learning is that a lot of the the principles and the guidelines help all learners, right? So you're, you're mm -hmm. leveling mm -hmm. and creating accessibility for the variation that we do have in our learning environments. And I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind is obviously there are those specific cases where there's, uh, you know, say there's low vision or, yeah. you know, just how other things physically can be uh, inaccessible as well. And I think that's where really diving into thinking about how do I, anything it's from as simple as how do I organize my my physical and digital learning environments um, to support that? How am I crafting challenges so that students can really understand them? Uh, for example, in the book, we also talk about the importance of how do you 
introduce how do you one how do you craft a challenge and think about that as as the teacher so you improve teacher clarity um, and then also looking at when you're introducing it to learners what are ways that you can build that vocabulary not only for the the content and the connections that they're studying but also to become more familiar with the design thinking process and I think it's really about you know how do we look at learner variability across the board and and set the stage for it Awesome. I was, um, uh, you know, thinking this morning, if you if you were to look on Twitter, uh, teacher Twitter, right, um, uh, as a monolith, and if you were to look at teacher Twitter, you would think that maker learning is like a big thing, like, and everyone is doing it. And it's like, it's like the next wave of whatever is happening in the world. It's so exciting. And it is. And, but the reality is, is that, you know, it's done in a very small amount of schools and, and, and districts. And, and to be honest, it also seems like one of those things like music actually is, is a victim of this as well, that, you know, when budgets have to get cut, this is what gets cut first, right? Mm -hmm. Music and, and making, um, and, and, a, uh, you know, a bunch of other things, visual art also, gets gets victimized here as well and so it, it seems to me that there's a bit of a conflict here because um you know the the skills that you learn when you're making things when you're when you're doing things like prototyping that you talk about in the book and when you're developing a plan and you're then executing on that plan these are skills that are hard to replicate in a lot of other subjects grades like a lot of other things you can't can't match um the skills that you learn in making and the way you learn them in my mind anyways and so you know i'm curious what you why you think there's a conflict there that we're we seem to be like deleting uh an area of education that that um could be really valuable um you know to students in in the way that they're they could learn but you so, know budget cuts and stuff yeah. i think a lot of times when you hear those scenarios and yeah. and and you hear like we're gonna cut this we're going to cut that whether it's hey resources for your makerspace or or so on and so forth anything in in that kind of realm and i think the biggest thing is that those decisions are often taking place because there is a lack of really I think deepening the understanding around what is the purpose of this work. And in my world, in my mind, I do believe that maker learning can, you know, I, I, I see it in a lot of different ways. I think, I think sometimes it's, oh, I, it can be, it's run by one teacher, I think, who specializes in that. In other cases, um, I work heavily in systems where it's how do we build capacity of classroom educators to use this as, as a method, uh, within their teaching to reach their, their content, uh, target, uh, targets and, and learning targets. And, um, I think the reason things get, cut a lot or people say, oh, that's an extra is because they're not really looking at what are the skills that maker learning helps us define that are different than the past. So for example, it gives us in, in my eyes, at least design thinking gives us the opportunity to really get into those computational thinker skills and the innovative design skills and problem solving. And if you, if you really, which I think is unfortunate if people aren't making that connection, because mm -hmm. if we really mm -hmm. look at what is our big picture as educators, and I think a lot of us would agree it's to prepare students not only while they're in the walls of our classroom, but to make them lifelong learners, right? And if we, if we look at this, what does it mean to be a lifelong learner in today's, um, global society. We look at, um, you know, the book Robot Proof talks about having human literacy. So understanding people um, and interactions, understanding data literacies and um, data sciences, and then technological literacy and looking at how different technologies are, are so embedded in our lives and how can they also assist in problem solving the way things are going. And I think if you, if you look at those values and you think about 
tr truly what do we need for college, career, and life readiness? I think that if you're if you're missing those literacies and seeing maker learning as a way to support that development, I think it becomes easy to cut. But so I, that's why also in the book, you know, I you know have a ton of stuff for classroom practitioners, but I also have a lot of resources and strategies for how do you build this within your system, whether you're talking about a building, a school district, yeah, or a classroom, because it really, it's, it's a, to me at least, it's looking at your organizational culture and say, what is the work we're doing? I also heavily believe in creating maker learning programs and efforts that are tightly aligned to the other goals, projects, and initiatives going on in your school system because it shouldn't be one more thing. Um, obviously, a, a new technology or a new system might be new, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're losing. It's once again, it's not about the stuff. It's about what's our big goal, what's our big focus, and how do we align it to the work that we already have in place and that we value. And every building is different, right? I mean, so it's not a mon. It's not like a you know one size fits all. Every every school, every district is completely different in their aims and their goals and what they can afford and you know everything, right? Absolutely. And I think that's also going back to, I know I talked about the importance of uh, looking at different online platforms and tools that can support virtual experiences for design thinking, prototyping, um, and just in collecting and interacting with data, like how students are able to do that. And I think sometimes we also need to look at, in, in addition to accessibility, what are ways that we can lean into some of those technologies and programs when say our money is running tight, how do we leverage the things that we have for these different purposes? Hmm. Yeah. You know, the other, the other thing I'm thinking as you're talking and, and Mike, you kind of alludes to what you're like, might be, maybe is one of the causes too. And, and I've, I've experienced this firsthand, you know, I was one of those, those, those teachers that was a tech teacher and I went to a conference and saw a 3d printer and I said, Oh, I have to have one. And I got my principal to buy me a maker bot. And then it sat on a shelf, basically unused. I think it's still being unused to this day regularly. Um, and so I, you know, I, but I think not only that, there's the, you get that teacher that comes in and, and, and really blows it out of the water for a year, but then there's, they don't end up sustaining it or keeping it going. So I think, you know, that I often find is is one of the problems I see with makerspaces here is it's either t dependent on one person or it's, you know, st big ideas and not in practice going through and doesn't have the, the staying power. Even if the funding is there, it doesn't seem to have the staying power. Um, and I, I kind of feel like the last couple chapters of your book address this from skimming them, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are in terms of maintaining this as a continual thing inside a of a school as a culture thing instead of just right. individuals i think a lot of it you know i mean say it again in a sense comes back to what is the vision of their that that school systems graduate per se what is what are those ideal skills knowledge and dispositions that you want learners to be able uh, to walk away with at the end of the day. And I think, you know, using, I also encourage um, educators, a lot of times educators will say, and I'll, I'll get back to your systems question in a second. They'll say like, you know, where's it fit in blah, blah, blah. Like I teach world language, blah, blah, blah. Where's it fit? I teach science. Where's it fit? I teach psychology. I teach math. You know, I'm not going to list everything out, but, <laughs> but they, they, but they're looking for how, where's the fit within your, um, specific curriculum and the standards you have to teach. And I say a lot of times our curriculum really offers an opportunity to have kids ask questions, make connections to the real world, identify authentic problems that exist in the world or in the past. And th how can that become a springboard for um, a maker learning experience? Or even if you're not doing a full design thinking process, Look, look to teach specific skills, right? Like look at what are ways we can help learners get better at generating and evaluating ideas, working with peers, um, learning uh, just how to leverage prototyping to dive deeper into how they can explain their ideas and, and make choices about different 
uh, tools and resources that they use to be able to share and explain their thinking. And I think that if school systems, whether they're big or small, start with looking at what are our core values as an organization? What do we, because chances are they have to do with somehow getting to developing a lifelong learner, right? And uh, the skills that would, would lead into into that. And I think a lot of times, if we don't make that connection for educators or even school leaders, I think it can be hard to find that sustainability because it's like, oh, it's one more thing that we have to add on. Instead of saying, actually, this could be a vehicle to obviously build additional skills, but also achieve the goals of our, our curriculum and learning targets. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree. I think that that's critical. Um, I, 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 the other thing I noticed in the book as I read through is there's a lot of sections in here about, and, and it seems pretty constant about going remote and um, having go remote pretty regularly. Um, and, and and being from Florida, I don't really understand why we would need to go remote. I don't understand <laughs> um, what that means for any reason. But um, oh, that's funny. I, that's a good one, Brad. Thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> but uh, ser- in, in a more serious question, is that something that was an intention pre-pandemic for you, or is that something that you know it? it like okay, so longevity, right? Hopefully, this pandemic is over at some point in the near future. Does that make the Does that mean the book doesn't have staying power, or how does this last beyond that? So there, there's a couple motivations for that. One, I, if when we look at accessibility, uh, there's a lot of options for looking at tools. So how are we providing learners with that voice and choice for how they're engaging in that? the process of learning, also working with educators in professional learning. Once again, what are those options for making learning visible, providing voice and choice, obviously um, extending beyond, you know, the limitations sometimes of being in the same place at the same time. Sometimes that's a barrier for people or how they're collecting data or running meetings. I think that there's a lot of reasons why someone would hopefully want to think about what what goals do these tools bring or what uh, benefits do these tools bring us. And I think obviously, yes, in a very literal sense, um, I think it allows for some of uh, this work to take place in a remote or virtual environment, especially when it comes to uh, creating that culture, leading professional learning, uh, working with students. Um, But I will say a lot of those same tools offer voice and choice. They offer the ability to visualize. Um, and, And sometimes it's we, some schools, like literally having some like physical resources sometimes, they, you know, it, I know it sounds almost silly, but it's like, hey, I want to do dot voting and, you know, no one's going to buy us these stickers and I don't want to buy them myself. So instead, I'm going to use dot storming the tool and do it virtually, you know, and, and there's other examples we give of like what you can use. But I also think some of the Go remotes look at, tools that we're already using and new ways to use them. So I think that's another value um, to the Go remotes is that I think it it holds like little insights to, oh, wait, I traditionally use this tool for that, but it could be used in this way as well. And I think, you know, helping us get over that functional fixedness is actually what it's called (laughs) when you only see something for its most common use. I, I think can actually be help us as practitioners be more innovative in our work as well. Caroline, where can people connect with you on, you know, social media? Uh, Where can they go to buy the book? I assume it's out now. Um, So where can they go to pick it up? So it, you can find it on obviously the ISTE bookstore, but also Amazon as well as other online retailers. Um, as well as uh, something that I think is another element is we have the Facebook group that people Mm -hmm. are welcome to join. And that link is connected to the online resources uh, that are QR code, QR coded in the book. And the point of that 
that element in that environment was to make it so that as things come out, I often like share other resources. I also am going to start highlighting different examples um, and, and work of other colleagues that I think can really motivate and other people can take, use, make their own. Um, and then also Twitter, things like platforms like that as well. Awesome. So we'll put We'll get the link from you for the Facebook group. We'll sure. put that in the show notes so that if anyone is interested, they can join us there. Um, Caroline Habig, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. This was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Brad Shuffler. My co-hosts are Mike Washburn and Glenn Urban. On Education is part of the On Podcast Media Network. You can listen to this show and many others by great educators like Monica Burns, Mike Matera, Tisha Richmond, and many more by visiting onpodcastmedia.com. Want to get in touch with us? Check out our website at oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Mike is Mr. Washburn on Twitter. Glenn can be found on Twitter at Herb Spanish, and I can be found at Brad Streffler. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. We're also on Instagram at oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we would be thrilled if you would share it with them. Please leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost. This helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Participate, for supporting us. Check out participate.com to learn more about them. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome and see you soon.